Good afternoon. We're convening the Senate Committee on Transportation on our 3 p.m. agenda here in Senate Conference Room 224 as well as on Zoom. We do have a handful of bills up today as well as a second 3.01 p.m. decision-making agenda. So we'll go through all the bills and we'll vote on both those agendas at the end. For folks who are tuning in, uh, we do have a number of people signed up to testify, so we will be limiting testifiers till two minutes to make sure everyone has an opportunity to speak. If we do get cut off, um, we will, we don't have any other days, do we? Okay. This we're is it. it. Yeah, we're not going to get cut off today. Yeah, yeah. whatever. So up first is SB 152 relating to child passenger restraint, which, am <coughs> excuse me, which amends requirements for the restraint of child passengers and requires rear-facing seats. Testifying first is the Department of Transportation. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members. Lena Araki Regan from the State Department of Transportation. We stand on our written testimony in support of this measure and are available for um, to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. We also have support testimony from the Strategic Highway Safety Plan, Kauai Office of the Prosecuting Attorney, Honolulu Police Department. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, Committee members, Major Walter Zeki from Honolulu Police Department. Uh, we stand on a written testimony in support of this bill also, and we're also available for any questions. Thank you. Up next is the Keiki Injury Prevention Coalition. Karen Tessie from the Keiki Injury Prevention Coalition. Um, we are the ones who um, proposed this bill, and we stand by our testimony, and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Up next is Kapiolani Medical Center. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Lisa Dow with Kapiolani Medical Center and I stand by our testimony and available for questions. Thank you. We also have uh, AAA Hawaii in support, the Juvenile Products Manufacturers Association with comments, and finally Hawaii Association for Justice. Oh, okay. Uh, we have comments. That's all the written testimony we have. Is there anyone who has any questions? If not, all right, thank you, everybody. Let's move on to the next measure, SB 1212, relating to motor vehicle registration, which amends the law relating to registration renewals and initial registrations of motor carrier vehicles uh, with outstanding federal out-of-service orders. And testifying first on 1212 is the Department of Transportation. Good afternoon. Chair, Vice Chair, and members, uh, Lena Rocky Regan from the State Department of Transportation. We stand on a written testimony and strong support. Thank you. Thank you. And that is, oh, we also have uh, the Hawaii Transportation Association in support. That's all the testimony we have. Are there any questions? If not, let's move on to SB 1213, relating to transportation, which repeals certain sections of HRS for the purpose of deleting obsolete or unnecessary provisions and testifying first on 1213 is DOT. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members. Lena Rocky Regan from the State Department of Transportation. We stand on our written testimony and strong support and are available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is uh, Harbors Division. DOT Harbors. I guess I'll speak on behalf of Harpers. Uh, Lena Rocky Regan for State Department of Transportation, Harpers Division, and strong support. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's all the testimony we have. Uh, anyone have any questions for DOT? If not, let's move on to the next measure, SB 1211, relating to motor carriers, which repeals the law relating to exemptions for vehicles designated as uh, farm vehicles. And testifying first on this one is Department of Transportation. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members. Lena Rocky Regan from the State Department of Transportation. We stand on a written testimony in strong support of this measure and are available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the testimony we have in this measure. Are there questions? If not, I've got uh, just one follow up for DOT on this particular measure. So um, right now, this appears to repeal a section of HRS which 
authorizes farm vehicles in mostly rural areas, I imagine, to be able to transit through public roads to access probably other parts of their farm or what have you. Is there a replacement for this that's on the books now in admin rules, or is there some plan that would continue to allow that? Chair, um, we have subject matter experts on the call with me from the highways division, including our highways um, de deputy director, Smithen. Chair, this is Ed. Hey, um, we, we're doing this to make sure that we're, we're in compliance with CFR Part 49. That was an update that, um, that the feds had put in together for this exemption. We'll work with um, those that are currently exempted to make sure that they have the same, the same rights when, we, when this is passed. Sure, and just to follow up to that, assuming we repeal this um, you know, July 1 or whatever the effective date is, how long would it be before that's actually in place? Um, we, can, we can work on it immediately with them. So no really, no hiccup in, okay. No, there, will be, there will be no impacts to those that, that, have, that currently have the exemptions. Okay, thank you. Any further thank questions you. on this measure? Uh, yes. Vice Chair. Okay, um, so are, are we talking about all farm vehicles or only the exemption for the covered form vehicles, the covered section? Those that are currently exempted. We're, working, we're, we're, we're looking at all of those. Okay, so um, how does the impact for farm, farm, a farm vehicle um, traversing on the highway if it's abutting, if the farm is abutting, and to get, because there are farms that have different entry and not connected, um, if a vehicle trans, uh, traverses onto the highway from getting out of one gate, and you're only like two minutes, less than two minutes, you're at the other entry, what happens then? The, the thing is, we're, <clears throat> what we're trying to do is make sure that we comply with the federal, federal law. Fully understanding that we want to make sure that we keep the practicality in all of this, the, our whole intention is to ensure that those that are connecting from farm to farm, just in small distances, can, be, can still be exempted. We're going to work with them to ensure that they're not impacted. That's, that's the whole goal of this. Yeah, but you know what? It's okay. Uh, um, aside from what I, I spoke about, about adjoining properties um, and there are this is Hawaii and no different when you look at the Kona farms the coffee farms um, Hamakua you have farms next door to each other and normally you would see and I would I think it's true for our entire state where there are um, rural areas and farms so you're gonna see um, you're gonna see a, a ve uh, and actually it's a vehicle because a farm vehicle uh, moving around on the highway, uh, and you see it often, uh, Ed, you, you see it yourself as well. So um, th that is actually, um, it, it will be illegal then already? Sorry, I don't, I don't understand the question on that one. Yeah, so, the, so you know, any vehicles you know. that traverse on the highway, it's, it's going to be a no for now. We, so again, we, we have the ability to, to give them um, special permits at this time while we cover them on, under exemptions. <clears throat> the whole intent, again, is to make sure we're, we're qualified under yeah, federal law. Yeah, I understand. Law. I understand okay. federal. I mean, that's, the, that's the big thing. The big thing is we got to get in compliance with federal law. Otherwise, we, we potentially could lose funding for the program. Fully understanding that we want to make sure that these connections that are already allowed, that are safe from our perspective, are still permitted. And we have the ability to do so. So the farmers would need to get permits then. I, I think, yeah, I think we have to educate the Farm Bureau so they can alert all these farmers because you see that daily, uh, no matter what island you're at. Exactly, and yeah. this, is no different, this is no different from farm vehicles or harbors operations and the like. No, the big so, ones then, no problem. It's, it's, the, it's the farmers <laughs> that needs to be educated that they're going to need permits. And many of them, I, I know that they don't have permits. Yeah, and we'll work with them. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I think we need to educate the Farm Bureau as well. Did they communicate with this measure? No, I, don't think they are, I don't think they understand this measure. Okay, thanks, I won't delay anymore. Okay. Okay, any further questions? If not, thank you very much, everybody.
Uh, let's move on to the next measure. Senate Bill 1216 relating to commercial driver's licenses, which adds a requirement for certain commercial driver's licenses to applicants to complete an entry-level driver training course before taking a skills sorry. test. Yeah, I think we missed one, 1210. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I did. Uh, sorry, my apologies, SB 1210 relating to motor carrier vehicle safety inspections, which expands the authority of the Director of Transportation over acquired motor vehicle carrier uh, inspections and authorizes DOT to adopt administrative rules. 1210 testifying first is DOT. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members. Lena Raki Regan um, on behalf of the State Department of Transportation. We stand on a written testimony in strong support of this measure and are available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is, oh, well, that is it for 1210. Are there any questions? If not, thank you. Let's move on to the next measure, now 1216. Uh, which is the CDL bill, which adds a requirement for certain commercial driver's license applicants to complete an entry-level driver training course before taking a skills test for licensure. And testifying first is DOT in support. Also, we have the Hawaii Transportation Association. I apologize, I saw you on the screen there. I didn't have you marked down to like speak. You're more than welcome to, of course, if you like. Um, Otherwise, we also have uh, Hawaii Transportation Association in support and uh, one individual with comments. And that's all the testimony we have on this measure. Uh, with that, there are no questions. Let's move on to the yeah, next one. Yeah, question, Jim. Oh, Senator Favela. Yeah, just one quick one. So this uh, CDL test, on driver's test, is the driver test I don't really understand the, the bill because before you take a road test and a written test, you go to uh, in, in intensive training to get your CDL. So is this a, a, a test after the test, driver's test? After you already have your driver's license, then uh, DOT or somebody will say, oh, you got to go take another test after so many years? Is that what it is, eh? John, John can give you more information on this, but in general, this is another bill that's getting us in compliance with federal law. Federal law is requiring us to move towards this direction, and, in, and for states who don't adopt it by February of next year, you could potentially lose your six, the, the $6 million that we get from, from FNCSA. John loves that. Jump on and uh, let us know where, how this test is going to be administered and what, what, what points. John. Who is calling? The police officer. No, John, John loves that's in our highway safety oh, side. Okay. He's on the call, but he's not responding to our request. Uh, you know, can you do me a favor and just, just email me the information to my email and then I can go look over. Yeah. I'll, send it, I'll send it to the committee. Because uh, I know something about the CDN. Yeah, I'll send can it to Can you hear me now? Yes, John. Go Am ahead. I coming through? Yeah. Okay, this, yeah, this is a requirement uh, where there was no discussion the the Congress just put it on the states to do this. And it's, it's a effort to prepare drivers to pass the test for the, for the program to get their license. So John, when does so the test occur? It, it, the way it's set up is uh, we'll have people who are qualified instructors they get they qualify through the uh, federal motor carrier safety administration and then they'll use a curriculum established by fmcsa and they will it will depend on the, the capabilities of the driver the experience of the driver some drivers might take longer in the program than others but when the, the, the trainer feels like the person is ready to go, then he'll sign them off and then the person would go and take the test. Okay. So Chair, um, I think uh, uh, Senator Favela, I think this is only for the entry level. So those that already have it um, is, is okay. That's correct. So the, is, the only reason why I bring this up is that um, guys go to the um, entry to $4,000 for somebody to certifyly train them. And after they're ready, they used to take it by, by a new rail, uh, working right stand now in, in the stadium. What I'm saying is that, is this gonna cost 
the driver or the person that's going to take the test after going through the four thousand dollar uh, training and getting certified to get ready for take the test is this going to cost the cdl driver any more money uh, i'm sure it will these people aren't going to do it for free that's what i'm saying so they paid one teacher right now 4500 for type a maybe five thousand after they get certified go to the training they're not a driver with that instructor pay him five thousand and now they're going to go to another training to get certified before they can take the test and they're going to pay for that test too is that what you're saying yeah now if they go through the five thousand dollar course they should be able to have a very minimal time in this other training the entry level driver training program because they've been taught but for somebody that doesn't go through that course then they, they might take a little longer going i'm sure they'll take longer going through it okay i just kind of confused because that was one of the federal standards back then when anybody that wanted to drive a commercial vehicle needed to get that training um at the school and doing all the walkthrough and and all of that and and then paying that fee then go to the stadium and then do your your testing with the instructor now you're going to do the five thousand dollar training and then you're going to go get certified from this other instructor and because they might have um a more experience or maybe they might be good enough drivers they're not going to be in the class long enough but it's going to be a financial problem they're really going to get grants and loans and figuring out how they can get the five thousand to get the cdl which right now in hawaii is a demand for cdl drivers because of the coronavirus and now we're going to have add another test on them i mean that's going to be a financial uh, burden on a lot of these guys who wants to get their type a license i, I just don't i just think you want to be fair and comply but i really don't think that's going to help the guy who's trying to get uh, a better paying job well, I, I should point out that it's not mandatory that they take a $5,000 class. Uh, a lot of employers will hire, let's take OTS, they hire a driver and then they train them. So it doesn't cost them anything. In fact, they even get paid while they're, while they're learning. So it's, there are other ways of uh, preparing for the test that then going through the $5,000 class. I don't know whether that's really the price, but we'll use that number. So if you've, if you've got the contacts or the resources that you're able to get trained, you, it doesn't matter who trains you or how long, just so you can pass the test. That's a big thing. But this is something that came down with no discussion with, with the states. It's just the Congress put it on them. And uh, I, I kind of feel like you do, too. It's like, I, I don't like it. Yeah. But, uh, we're kind of stuck with it and uh yeah no, no i was just talking about i mean i know you're talking about the bus and uh, transportation i was just talking about mostly the tractor trailer semi trailer truck to truck like that i do um go from type b to type a and just making that leap will cost a little bit more money and believe it or not that's the that's the point right now is 45 when i when i do my test it was only 2500 it's double now because of the demand but that's the reason why i was asking these questions Thank you guys for your time. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you, Ed. Okay, thank you. Further questions on this measure? If not, just a quick follow-up. Um, Ed, you guys had a couple of housekeeping amendments to the bill that you had suggested in your testimony on this one. Yes, please. Is that just, just to adopt as is? That's correct. I mean, sorry, the amendments to adopt, um, the amendments as it. Adopting the bill with an, with an amended draft, including those amendments. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you, everybody. Let's go on to the final measure on our agenda today, SB 57, relating to vehicle inspections, which codifies certain certification renewal and violation processes of vehicle inspectors who conduct vehicle safety inspections under DOT. And testifying first, uh, we have Department of Transportation, in support. Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Lena Rahi Regan from the State Department of Transportation. We stand on our written testimony in support. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, Honolulu Police Department. Good evening, Chair, members of the committee. Major Calvin with the Honolulu Police Department. We stand by our testimony, uh, written testimony in support of this bill. Thank you. 
We also have additional testimony from Oahu Motorsports Association in support. And about... 73. 73? Yep. 73 individuals in support with, looks like just a handful, maybe uh, five or six opposition. with comments or opposition. Uh, but that's everybody who's uh, wanted to testify in person today. Uh, are there any questions on this measure? I'll just, um, real quick for HPD, if you're still with us. Uh, in your testimony, you had noted um, generally just a, a couple points of concern regarding the process of recon doing some basic vetting that otherwise isn't currently possible with safety checks. Um, if we were to fold a couple of those key points into safety checks, uh, so for example, if you have tires that exceed your wheel wells outside fenders and basically said as a part of the safety check, just check on that. It's, you know, it takes one second to take a look. Um, is that something you guys would be okay with? Yes. Um, as long as um, the safety check stations do those checks, um, we'll, be, we'll be comfortable with it. We just didn't want um, nobody looking at their reconstruction and they can just go out and do whatever they want. Um, I think the uh, safety check stations would have to uh, make those checks. Okay, thank you. And then, um, oh, before I go on, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Senator, 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 jump in. I, I have one. Senator Favela. And um, this came up before and uh, talked to my friends that do safety check. Um, under the safety check, they cannot let tires stick outside the fender well anyway. And they still gonna have to go to be in compliance of the regular safety check by Hawaii state laws. And, and even though they do away with the recon, that the recon never really uh, helped the community uh, for decades. Um, I think having those checks is gonna be done because uh, they don't wanna lose their station and their safety check license. Uh, this is John. This is John with the Department of Transportation. Uh, that's true. They, what, what happens typically is people will put fender flares over the tires, go in for their inspection, and then after they get their inspection, they go home and take the flares off. That's why you see them out there. But that is a part of the regular program. If there are no further questions, then just following up um, with DOT on that. Uh, I'm not uh, off the top of my head familiar with all the different components of a safety check, but um, one of the things that we did do is look at all the different components of a typical recon check and try to identify you know, what might make sense to keep um, and fold into a safety check process separate from the existing recon should it go away and should the bill pass. And so um, I, I don't know if you can speak to this, but just walking down the list, I had four things here that we took a look at. One was um, the fender issue, which I think we had just spoken about. The other was looking at making sure that there are rear mud guards that cover um, the width of the tire treads so that you're not flying mud up into the car behind you. Uh, and stop me if these are not part of the current safety check right now. And then looking at maximum bumper height to ensure that if there's accidents and whatnot, you're not gonna have somebody killed inadvertently by a super high vehicle. Um, and so in the current recon check, there are certain standards um, for how many inches above ground level a bumper can be, for example. And then the last one was looking at, um, oh, the last one was looking at just a separate measure, um, which we had heard previously, which was uh, monitoring uh, modified exhaust noise. Uh, so I guess the question is, is it suffice it to say, are all of these or could all of these be covered by the existing safety check process? Yes, they're all in there. The, the only one that people don't typically do is the bumper height, but that's, there is a, a requirement to, to comply with the state law in the inspection program. Okay. So if an inspector sees that a, a truck, for example, has been lifted pretty high so that they suspect that the bumper height is beyond uh, the limits, then they can take a measurement and make a decision there. Yeah, as far as the exhaust. Yeah, yeah, this is it. All of those can be included in the safety check. We can make sure that our, we can make sure that our um, inspectors include all of that in the safety check. 
Sure. But the one thing, just following up on that, for the noise thing, um, I, I went through the recon process when I had my one of my race cars back in the day <laughs> in another life that I had to go through it. Uh, but I don't really remember that process. But I do remember at one point um, for exhaust noise, I don't know if they actually measured that. And is that, so if there's like, is there like a decibel level or something that it's looked at? No, we don't use decimal meters. Yeah, that, that's not part of the, the safety check process. Nor was it part of the recon process, I believe. Hmm. No, we, it wasn't. Because we did have another bill that this committee looked at uh, last week that would have provided some sort of limit. I think it might have been 90 or 95 decibels for just vehicles in general. And I don't think it specified whether that was at idle or at max RPM. I assume it's at max RPM. Um, but should that bill separately pass, would that then be a part of the existing safety check process? Well, it, I don't think it would be practical to make it part of the safety check program because it's easy to set a vehicle up to pass the inspection and then go home and change it. Yeah. So, and then and if you give officers a meter, they yeah. can't do the, the <laughs> test on the road. It's not safe and you got a lot, a lot of ambient noise. It's a rather sophisticated measurement You've got to have a special measure uh, unit, a sound meter, and then you've got to have a tachometer. The way the SAE requirements are, you bring the car up to 3,000 RPMs and you've got to do it gradually so that you don't go above 3,000. If you go above, you've got to start over again. And when you get a, each car has a different way of doing that. You know, in some cars, you can't even do it from uh, under the hood. You, uh, because it's all electronic. So it's a difficult thing to get it to 3,000. Then you've got to do it a, another, a few more tests until you get two tests that are within two decibels of each other. So it's a complicated, time-consuming thing. We did some experiments and decided it's really not worth the effort for the inspection program. I think, I think the only way it would work for the- John, John, Chair, I think um, we would have to go back and take a look at what other states are doing to see how best to consider um, that decibel measurement to that go past. Sure. I think the one thing, um, and you know, we can follow up on this later. I know um, we want to be supportive of, I think, everything the department's doing, of course. But we are going to hear it probably from some of our urban colleagues um, should there continue to be you know, just people who do all kinds of crazy stuff with their exhausts and whatnot. So uh, just for the discussion, um, maybe we can follow up on that later on. So we will do, and, and like I said, we'll follow up on that because we're going to be supportive of what the legislative body is looking at as well, um, and definitely um, be uh, considerate to the concerns of the public. Sure. Yeah. I, I just want to add, though, um, I kind of agree with what John is saying. Uh, another thing, too, is we all got to realize that the number of safety check stations has declined, and so when you're going to add any more um, uh, test, um, I, I guess, test tools and, you know, the infrastructure that comes for such a, uh, just a certain type of uh, inspection. Um, I don't know if we're going to have a lot more other uh, inspect, inspection stations that are going to stay uh, alive. So we, we just got to be careful. That, that's just to add to it because uh, several of us, um, particularly in this area as well, I, I think that you lost a number of inspection stations and they're traveling from uh, different communities to get to a station. I think I'm correct, right, Ed? Yes, and we'll, that's why we'll look at the practicality of yeah, our exactly. Um, in what type of program it would be in. Okay. Thank you. Just to be cautious. Any further questions? If not, all right, thank you everybody. That is the last measure on our first 3 p.m. agenda. So what we'll do is we'll recess for decision making and come back for decision making on both our 3 p.m. as well as the carryover measures on our 3.01 oh, okay. p.m. agendas. So we're going to recess.
Good afternoon. We're reconvening the Committee on Transportation for decision-making on our 3 o'clock and 3.01 p.m. agendas here in Conference Room 224 and online at the State Capitol. Uh, up first on our 3 p.m. agenda is SB 152 relating to child passenger restraints. Um, we'd like to move this as is. Okay. Chair's recommendation on SB 152 is to pass unamended. Chair Lee. Aye. Vice Chair goes aye. Senator English. Aye. Senator Shimabukuro. Aye. Senator Favela. Aye. Measure is adopted, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Moving to SB 1212 relating to motor vehicle registration. Uh, this update updates registration renewals and initial registrations for motor carrier vehicles. Um, we'd like to move this forward, just adopting some tech amendments. Uh, in an amended draft, as well as adding in a 2050 effective date. Okay. Chair's recommendation on SB 1212 is to pass with amendments of all members, pre uh, five members present. Any uh, reservations? Any no's? Measure is adopted, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Up next, SB 1213 relating to transportation. This is updating HRS for the purposes of deleting obsolete or unnecessary provisions, perhaps the most controversial bill of the year. Uh, we'd like to move this forward um, simply with a 2050 effective date. Okay. Chair's recommendation on SB 1213 is to pass with amendments with five members present. Any voting with reservations or any no's? Measure is adopted, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Up next is SB 1211 relating to motor carriers, which repeals the exemption for vehicles designated as vehicles used by farmers. Um, we'd like to move this forward with a defective date of 2050, but we'd also like to note in the committee report some of the concerns raised uh, on the switchover and timelines and execution of a uh, switch that would allow farmers to continue their current practice to be able to uh, go from one field to the next um, over public highways. We understand DOT has um, uh, plans in place, so we'd like to follow up, but just note that for uh, reference for the next committee. Okay. Chair's recommendation on SB 1211 is to pass with amendments. Are there any, uh, with five members present, any voting with reservations? Um, the vice chair will vote with reservations. Uh, any no's? Measure is adopted. Thank you. Any reservations, sorry. Okay. Yeah, okay, I guess I'll go with reservations too because I don't see why we really need this right now. All right. Anybody else? Okay, uh, measure is adopted, Mr. Chair. So noted, thank you. Up next, SB 1210 relating to motor carrier vehicle safety inspections, which expands the authority of DOT over authorized, uh, excuse me, over motor carrier vehicle inspections and authorizes DOT to adopt administrative rules. I'd like to move this forward, um, just amending the effective date to 2050. And that's it. Okay. Two amendments. Chair's recommendation on SB 1210 to pass with amendments uh, with five mem members present. Any voting with reservations? Any no's? Many, um, Mr. Chair, measure is adopted. Thank you. Up next is SB 1216 relating to commercial driver's licenses, which adds a requirement for a certain commercial driver's license applicants to complete an entry level driver training course. Um, we'd like to move us forward adopting the DOT amendments, housekeeping amendments. Um, to be compliant with federal law. Secondly, adding in a 2050 effective date. And third, making other uh, minor tech amendments. Okay, Chair's recommendation on SB 1216 is to pass with amendments. Uh, amendments with five members present. Any voting with reservations? Any no's? Measure is adopted, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, up next, did we lose Miley? Oh. Okay. Oh, there she is. Okay. Uh, up next, <laughs> didn't want to vote uh, without you on this one, Miley. Uh, up next is SB 57 relating to vehicle inspections, which codifies certain certification renewal and violation processes of vehicle inspections who conduct vehicle safety inspections under DOT and repeals requirements for uh, reconstructed vehicles to obtain special inspection and certification. We'd like to move this one forward, making a couple amendments. Um, first. Um, this committee did move a measure on uh, loud exhausts um, the other day, so we'd like to add in a similar requirement into this bill which would require uh, exhaust noise checks as part of the safety check process. We'd also like to note in the committee report that uh, there are other certifications that the current recon process 
uh, dealt with, which included ensuring that there were tires not protruding outside of fender wells, ensuring that there are basic mud guards to ensure that uh, uh, stuff isn't flying onto windshields, and uh, second, or excuse me, uh, fourthly, looking at bumper heights to ensure that if there are accidents, um, people are going to be safe. So with that, we'd just like to note in the committee report that those, um, we believe, are components of the existing safety check, and should this measure move forward, that we would expect those to continue to be uh, part of the traditional safety check instead of the recon process. Thank you. Chair's recommendation on SB 57 is to pass with amendments with five members present. Any voting with reservations? Any no votes? Measure is adopted, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, that is the end of our first 3 p.m. agenda, so we'll move on to our 3.01 p.m. agenda. Uh, these measures were previously heard in this committee earlier in the week. Up first is SB 1308 relating to concessions, which provides the Department of Transportation with more flexibility and discretion to address substantial hardship situations that impact airport concession contracts. I uh, appreciate the um, outreach and testimony of, I think, a lot of the folks in the hearing. We did have a, uh, some time to talk with a lot of the stakeholders, including the Department of Transportation, as well as some of the uh, concessionaires and others. And we note that obviously with COVID, this has been a very difficult year for everyone. I think it is the intent of this committee to ensure that everybody is treated uh, fairly um, by the state and as well ensure that as we go forward this year, uh, we hope for additional support from the federal government um, and there may be other measures that uh, become available as tools to assist uh, those who are in need in the coming months. Um, that said, uh, what we want to do is uh, defer this measure for the time being um, and engage instead in an uh, ongoing conversation that's going to look at what meaningful steps can be taken rather than just providing tools to the department to take action. Instead, uh, really what makes sense as these new tools become available and how can we ensure that there is fair uh, treatment for all, including the taxpayers of the state as well as the concessionaires at the airport. So um, it is my commitment as the chair of the committee to ensure that that conversation continues and we'll be engaging in that in the months to come, weeks and months to come, I should say. Uh, so that said, we may revisit this um, uh, as a resolution or some other uh, vehicle as may be necessary going forward, but for the time being, we'll defer this measure. Um, secondly, uh, SB 1368 relating to airfields now this prohibits the eviction of any tenant of um, Kauai Airfield from being evicted from the airfield until the expiration of the DOT and U.S. Department of the Army's lease. Um, this in particular, uh, similarly, we've spoken with a lot of stakeholders and appreciate everyone's outreach. We know that uh, similarly to the airport, um, uh, to HNL or to DKI, uh, the stakeholders at this particular airfield have had uh, some tough times, but have also had a lot of issues that need to be resolved that long precede uh, this bill and our discussion here. Um, what we'd like to do, um, having worked with some of those stakeholders, including the Department of Transportation and others, um, and I'll note uh, we all gathered out at the airfield yesterday and had the start of a discussion, we would like to um, change this measure and amend it. Um, to a process that we think will be inclusive and hopefully successful at addressing all of the concerns, um, chiefly the safety concerns that are out there and present, as well as a number of others. So what we're going to do is make this a task force that includes all stakeholders, Department of Transportation, as well as uh, we'll invite the Army, our U.S. Congressional delegation, stakeholders at the airfield itself, and others. And we're going to ensure that they work together in good faith uh, to try and resolve a number of the key measures, which include what happens with the water system uh, at the airfield, which is currently um, in limbo. Uh, secondly, what's going to happen to the structures, um, making sure that those come into compliance with permitting and other uh, measures as, uh, excuse me, pursuant to law. Um, also looking at safety and best practices and ensuring those standards are upheld. Finally, um, making sure that there's a long-term lease that the state has uh, to be executed with the Army. Uh, and there are a few other uh, provisions in here uh, which will all require to be met. And so the idea is that by June 30th of this year, 
um, the date at which currently I think the Department of Transportation is looking at uh, potentially shutting down the airfield. Um, instead, we'll ask this working group, the stakeholder group, to get together and come up with plans to address each and every one of these outstanding issues and commit to seeing those through uh, as, the, as the year goes on. And it, so the, the task force, working in good faith, will try to resolve these uh, for uh, the continued operations of the airfield and for everyone's safety and longevity. Um, provided that those conditions are met by June 30th of this year. That there's a plan for those by June 30th for this year. Um, the task force will go on for another year until June of 2022, um, regularly reporting its progress in executing that plan. So bringing things up to code, um, taking steps as necessary to make sure that we're gonna have a safe and successful operation going forward for everybody. We think this is a, uh, um, collaborative effort and I think coming off of the conversations with all the stakeholders yesterday will provide a path toward um, an actual future there. So with that, um, we'd like to move this as an SD1, uh, moving it to a task force with the uh, aforementioned provisions. Okay. Chair's recommendation on SB 1368 is to pass with amendments with five members present. Any voting with reservations? Any no votes. Measures adopted, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. That's the end of our agenda. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's the last yes. hearing on our Senate measures. So thank you everybody, the Transportation Committee. Yes. Thank you to our staff online uh, for running everything smoothly and doing the due diligence behind the scenes. We're adjourned. Good, okay. Ooh.